The first task of a new administration will be to review and re-examine every course of action open to us with one goal in view, to bring the Korean War to an early and honorable end. It's on. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, um, let's start that. Uh, when I was just ready to leave high school, uh, things were. I went to have a went to work for the newspaper. Uh, had, took an apprenticeship as a photographer, and uh, things were going uh, real good. And I had met uh, had had met. My wife, Marilyn, uh, had a had a dance. It was a church dance. They they had them uh, had them in the, in the basement of the St. Anne's Church. Um, it was every Sunday evening, and uh, we'd go down there and dance. I think I was probably standing on the side talking to somebody, and probably danced a couple times. And then Dad come up and asked me to dance, and that's how we met. In fact, I had a, a Cushman motor scooter, and uh, we'd go uh, go for rides on that. So we had been, we had been seeing each other for quite some time, and I would visit her while she was working in a, a Kresge uh, store downtown Moline. And so when I uh, went to work for the newspaper, at, which was down down Moline. Uh, I would stop and see her, and um, um, things were, I guess it would be like being in a comfort zone. Things were going, going well until, until I got my notice, and um, I knew I was going to get drafted because the war had been going on. Actually, on the second date, he proposed because he had gotten his papers that he had to go into service. And he said, I don't want to lose you. Will you marry me? Or will you wait for me something? And, uh, you know, will you marry me? I want to marry you when, we, when I get back. And I said, don't worry about it. All of a sudden, I got this uh, notice uh, that uh, the guy at the Army wanted me. And so that kind of, um, it was kind of a shock because um, uh, here you're taken away from being comfortable into a, a situation where you never knew what was going to happen. I, I got this uh, notice on uh, January 4th of 1952 and uh, uh, saying that uh, the report for duty and uh, uh, it's um, war has got a uh, just going into the army uh, it wouldn't be so bad. But all of a sudden, there's a war going on, and 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 things start going around in your mind. And uh, um, anyway, uh, even for uh, Marilyn and I, uh, things were all of a sudden going to be changed. They're going to be different. We, I guess, uh, we had made plans that when I, came, I got out of the service, when I came home, that we would get married, and so we. Uh, it was kind of like, uh, oh, kind of a quick engagement in, in a way that, uh, but uh, we, we, had, uh, we had our plans that when I, when I got back, we'd get married. So in the meantime, we, we rode back and forth, uh, uh, I guess almost every day. And, uh, and by the way, uh, Marilyn would also send me uh, cookies every once in a while. Which uh, uh, I had to hide from the other, from the other guys. Otherwise, uh, <laughs> there wouldn't be any left. So I would kind of keep them to myself. But anyway, getting back to uh, uh, getting drafted, 
Um, uh, <coughs> I, I got on a train uh, in Rock Island to, uh, to go to Chicago for, uh, uh, to get my physical. And um, here I am, I've, you know, he's never been on a plane or a train or anything before that time. Here I was only about 19 years old. But um, I went to Chicago and uh, you're amongst, uh, you know, thousands of other guys. I mean, I mean it's, it's kind of a kind of a mixed feelings because all of a sudden there you are and uh, put in with all these guys and... Uh, Anyway, when I went, one of the one of the interesting things about getting my physical, uh, as everybody knows, I'm I'm not too good on uh, getting shots and and needles aren't uh, aren't my best conversation. But anyway, when I, the first time I got got my shots, um, I, I passed out. And when I woke up, uh, it was a, I remember it was big black. Uh, uh, doctor, he was looking down at me and he says, uh, how you doing, son? And uh, I, like I said, that was one of those things I, I'll never forget. But uh, that was the start of my being in the Army. And so then uh, when we got into, uh, <clears throat> got our physicals and everything in uh, in Chicago, uh, Fort Sheridan. And then we, uh, we took a tra uh, train uh, to um, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, where I, I was in basic training with a camp there called Camp Chaffee. We had uh, 16 weeks of training, eight weeks on, uh, on uh, the M1, uh, let's see, the M1 uh, gun, uh, gun, and then uh, eight weeks on the carbine. And uh, in between, you know, you were, you, you were trained to, uh, to kill or to be killed. That's just pretty much uh, what it amounted to. And, uh, uh, you you more or less lived that for 16 weeks, and uh, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of marching, a lot of um, just a lot of training. I guess it would be nice if 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 you could just do your training, be, you know, eight hours a day between eight and four thirty. But it, it doesn't work that way. They they wake you up real early, and uh, it doesn't make any difference what time of day they they get you out there. It was uh, it was good training. I mean, uh, uh, put a lot of muscle on me. After we had our 16 weeks, and we got our orders as to what units we were going to be sent to, and uh, mine was uh, with the First Cavalry Division uh, up on northern Japan. After the 16 weeks, I came home for, for um, um, a vacation, or I mean, uh, a leave. <laughs> anyway, it was about, I think it was 10 days we got. And so, once again, uh, that was right over uh, Christmas and New Year's. Once again, we get on a train to go to Oakland, California, which uh, today, they'll get, you, they'll get you there to, you know, in one day, but this took probably two, day, uh, two days on a train to uh, California. So, uh, a lot of it was at night, so we didn't see a lot going through the hills and everything. But anyway, we got to California, and we had to wait around for for three or four days, I think it was, and um, waiting waiting for our ship. So anyway, we were all put on a on a big big ship, and uh, that's the first time I ever been on on a ship. But anyway, that was quite an ex experience too, and it took about. I think about 10 days to uh, to get over to uh, to Japan. Being on a ship, it's good when the weather is good, but it, it can get pretty uh, get pretty uh, rough out there. Once we got to Japan, then we took a once again another train. Once we got to Tokyo or Yokohama, we took a train up to the northern part of of uh, Japan, a place called Hokkaido. I was in the infantry, uh, assigned to the infantry company of uh, the 1st Cav Division. And uh, we had to replace another unit over in, over in uh, Korea, the 24th Division. So every, every so much time, they, uh, we would uh, 
the 24th would come in for a rest and then the 1st Cavalry would come in and replace them. So at this particular time we were going to replace the 24th. We took a ship over there and uh, on our way over to Korea there, uh, we, uh, we heard there was a Russian sub that was uh, kind of following us and so that kind of left us kind of uneasy. Uh, you never knew uh, if we were going to get blown up or not, you know. So yeah, this is wartime. When I was traveling from, from um, Japan over to Korea, uh, one of the ships that was, uh, was uh, f escorting us over there, there was uh, a neighbor, uh, when, I was, when I was back home uh, as a young boy, uh, the neighbor lived across the street in the name of um, Wayne Davis. Anyway, he, somehow or other, I knew he, he was on a particular ship, and anyway, that happened to be the ship that was escorting us over there. And so, uh, we, um, I would somehow I, 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 I pulled strings and uh, got somebody to call over, and tell him I was on there. And so, anyway, when we when we got to Korea, uh, his ship and our ship uh, were bow to bow, uh, right next to each other. So. I, I called over, and he got on the end of one, and I was on 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 the end of mine, and we were talking back and forth, and it was just it was just here we are, you know, uh, that far away from home, and yet we were we were able to talk back and forth. It was uh, it was a, quite a surprise. We we got over to uh, Korea, and uh, it's um, I don't, it it. When you get there, it's um, there's not a lot to not to see there. Um, everything's pretty primitive. I mean, it's it's not like coming into Winona or La Crosse or anywhere else. It's you're coming right onto the the, the sea, seashore there, and there's just uh, oh, you know little Quonsets and I mean little little shacks and everything like that. But uh, these people are all living with very little. But anyway, we got unloaded, and we were sent to uh, um, sent sent to this uh, this unit, and I was assigned to uh, with a with a military unit. As, um, we uh, guarded um, supply trains and hospital trains up and back. The, s the smells over there is um, the the country they. Uh, it's a very once you get that smell, you never forget it. Uh, these these people there, you know, they don't have the the luxuries we have as sewers and everything else. And yeah, theirs is all um, uh, in ditches and everything, and they use it for for fertilizers and the uh, and the fields and that. So I mean, uh, it's not not the, not the sweetest smelling uh, uh, places to be. It would be nice if if wars were fought when. Uh, uh, when the weather's real nice, but uh, unfortunately, even like in Korea, it, you know, it rained a lot, or or it get very very cold and um, uh, damp and um, muddy and everything else, and so uh, this this always added some to the kind of the discomfort. When I was assigned to the to the military outfit uh, as an MP. And uh, this is a different kind of MP. The ones that you probably think about are always maybe directing traffic. Um, but uh, what, what we did was um, uh, there was uh, the last uh, car on a on a train. We were, they had, they uh, had machine guns and different kinds of guns on the back there that we we uh, guarded. Uh, uh, the the train up and back, and so once again, uh, it'd be nice if if there was um, uh, cover in that, so you you didn't have to worry about the rain or anything or the cold and everything. But that's not the way it was. So we uh, we would ride that that last car up and back. Saw a lot of saw a lot of wounded uh, when we we'd bring them back, and uh, the wounded would be the uh, the Koreans, this, uh, the North Koreans, that uh, that got wounded, and they were all young guys, like 
like I was, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old. And uh, it's just, uh, it just, uh, it's too bad, you know, they were just there to uh, do the same thing we were doing, you know, fighting each other. And uh, saw a lot of dead. I mean, they'd, they'd lay them out on the ground, I mean, by the hundreds, you know. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not a very pretty picture to see. You know, you always, you always hear about the, the enemy always torturing, um, torturing us, you know, especially during and when you're a prisoner or anything else. But I've seen it where, where we, we, uh, we torture them. I've seen them where um, you get two guys uh, facing each other and say that yeah, you can't get the information out of them. So what you do is you, you get two guys to face each other and you give them each a, a, a board. And uh, and what you do is you tell the uh, tell the one guy to hit the other guy, and uh, at first you know he's he's not going to hit him very hard. So what you do is you they'd show him how to hit him. So they'd take him, they'd hit him, whack him good, and so okay they do it like that. So he'd hit him, and of course if somebody hits you like that, that you're going to hit the other guy right back. And so they'd just kind of they'd do it and just kind of to a point where they'd almost kill each other, you know from just hitting each other. And so, I mean, this is one of the forms of uh, torture they would, uh, they would do. And uh, another one was that they'd take a steel pipe, uh, kind of a long, long steel pipe, uh, and they'd make them uh, kneel on it right in the, right, right above their, their knee and make them kneel on it for, we'll say half hour, an hour or whatever. But you try it sometime and you can't get up. It it uh, it cuts off everything, and you're just uh, uh, well. It just it's it's not a it's probably not a, not a good thing to do. But so these are some of the things that uh, uh, I've seen anyway. Then when we weren't uh, guarding, weren't uh, on these trains uh, going up and back, uh, then we'd maybe uh, guard the, the railroad yards. And uh, keep uh, keep the civilian uh, North, excuse me, South Korean civilians from going in there. And uh, a lot of times they'd try and take the cars apart and use the wood for for firewood. And of course, then there was also the uh, the cars that were loaded with grain. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> they'd go in there with big um, metal pokers underneath, and they'd jab holes and be able to run away with you know, take all this grain and run away with it. And, you know, once again, these are people that are hungry and uh, they'll do anything to, uh, uh, to get food or to get, some, get something to, to keep warm with. I know this one time uh, it, was, it was dark and I, uh, I walked through the railroad car. I saw some activity up in front and uh, I guess I was, I was all by myself and um, I... I saw the activity up there, and I went in the back back door of the railroad car. And I was going up the aisles, and it was one of those uh, cars that uh, it was used for sending um, the military uh, people, the soldiers, up and uh, back. There was all there were all seats, in other words. And so I was walking up there, and I I didn't have my flashlight on, and but I had my hand on my 45, and I walked all the way over, and I I saw these some activity in between the seats and I, I showed my you know, my flashlight at him and I had my gun and I says, Hey and I kinda of startled him and here it was just some young kids and they were they had these little uh rusty cans and they would they would they were going in between the seats and catching the little bits of crackers and whatever servicemen would be dropping on the floor and they would pick it up and put it in these cans and that was that was their food. So I mean, they, once again, and then what, interesting is that one of the kids, he had a makeshift crutch. He only had one, he only had one leg, and thinking that maybe he probably lost it with a, a landmine or well, who knows what. But <clears throat> you saw a lot of an awful lot of these uh, young kids uh, uh, that probably never had a haircut. I mean. They would wear maybe sometimes a helmet, and you know, they took the helmet off. It was, yeah, it was in the shape of their 
uh, their their hair and everything was in the same shape as that helmet was on the inside from it's you know it's it's all they wore and so they and uh, I don't think they've ever had a bath you know and but uh, uh, I I felt real bad about it and uh, you know I would every time I'd go out for in the uh, to go eat or whatever I'd I'd stick some other things in my pocket whenever I see these kids you know I would I would give them some but uh, uh, of course there's no way of, you can take care of all of them but I mean if you can take care of a few I guess it's it's a start you know we we're talking about the torture and war has a way of some people they um, uh, some guys you know they they take the privilege of uh, being in, in the in these situations where they can you can kind of like do whatever you want to do without uh, uh, getting uh, reprimanded for it. In other words, we could be riding on the train and somebody might take a pot shot at, a, at an animal or could be even a person out there. And, you know, and uh, uh, I know another thing is once in a while, there'd be a there'd be a soldier, uh, a Korean soldier, on the on the train, and once we get going pretty good speed, well, they'd they'd more or less uh, boot the guy right out the door, and uh, I mean, really, uh, you you didn't know who the 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 good Korean or the bad Korean was. I mean, uh, it's almost like like over here, you know, you got your your north and your south, and you don't know. I mean, if it was a war, and uh, you wouldn't know whether the guy was from the, from the, from the north or from the south, unless he had a uniform on. And that was the that was the thing about that war. Uh, you didn't know who your enemy was because he did. Maybe a lot of them didn't even wear a uniform, you know. And so, you you just never knew. Um, you were never really safe. But thank God, I. Uh, I made it, uh, made it through it. I never, I never had to kill anybody, and I, um, uh, and I never got wounded. You're, you're with a bunch of, a, a lot of, a lot of good guys over there, and uh, you're just, you're just a small part of this, this big army. But like I said, you, you get to meet some special guys that you, you get to be friends with, and for a while until you rotate. So we. We were over there for about a year, <clears throat> and then we moved back to uh, Japan. Uh, we rotated back to Japan, and once I uh, got back to Japan, I was um, <clears throat> I was uh, showing. Um, uh, whenever I wasn't busy, I would show movies to the to the troops, and uh, I was kind of a movie operator, and. Uh, yeah, that was that was interesting until, till the movies would, uh, till the film would break, and it, it seems like it'd break every so often because uh, uh, they were big reel, big reels of uh, film, and uh, they were used so many times they were just shipped all over the, all over the country, you know, and so every time it'd break, you'd everybody go, oh, you know, and a lot of noise until you got the, you spliced it and you got it all back together again, and then you started up again and everything was okay, but. I would do that, and then I would. I was uh, photographing. I had gotten a, a better camera at the at the PX, and um, so then I was I was photographing some boxing matches, and I I got I got some pictures of uh, the boxers. One guy was got his uh, teeth. Uh, oh, uh, the thing that they put between the teeth that kind of kind of came out of his mouth uh, when. When he got when he got hit real hard, and I got a picture of it, and I showed it to the right people, and that, and then for, anyway, I got I got transferred to the Signal Corps, where I became a photographer, uh, Army photographer, and uh, once I got into that, it uh, it was kind of fun. We one of my jobs was to travel all, the whole island of uh, Hokkaido and photograph bridges, and the reason we photographed bridges was to uh, if we ever got an attack attacked by the enemy up on uh, northern Japan and if uh, they had to move out we had to know you know uh, know about the bridges as to uh, if they had to be either crossed or had to be rebuilt or anything like that so that that was one of those things and 
So I got to see an awful lot of that country up there just by photographing bridges. And then I also photographed um, parades and, oh, there was always somebody getting an, uh, an award for something. And then also uh, football, uh, photographed some football games up there. And uh, uh, But anyway, uh, that, uh, that part of the country is almost like northern Michigan where you get an awful lot of snow in the wintertime. Oh, I suppose uh, eight eight foot of snow up there, you know, it just stays on the ground all, all winter. But And then you have all your winter sports, but it's uh, it got cold. We're up there about, uh, about a year, and uh, I, I became um, sergeant. And uh, I'm trying to think whether or not it was sergeant after I got to back to Japan or when I was in Korea, one or the other. But anyway, it was one of those deals where uh, I made sergeant in, oh, it was, it was, it actually it was in 18 months. And uh, back then during the war, there was either somebody getting killed or somebody getting rotated, so they always had to have so many sergeants and lieutenants or whatever else, so many of in each unit. So I just happened to be lucky and I, I got to become uh, a sergeant anyway. Uh, and most of the guys I, I came up there with uh, never made it, uh, never made it to that point, which, which, which is no big deal. We were up there for about a year, and then I got my, um, got my, got our notice to, uh, to go back to the states. I was, yeah, I was real excited about coming back, but it was, but then uh, started off. I think we had about four duffel bags of clothes by the time uh, when I left there. Of course, it was winter, winter stuff and everything else. And so we went to, uh, down to uh, J southern Japan, which is uh, where I was going to catch a boat, catch a ship back to the States. So we took the train down there, and we, I left a big bag there. It seemed like every so often I'd leave one of the bags, and when I got back to California, I think it would more or less the clothes on your back is about what you ended up with, but uh, so we took the we took the ship back to to California and uh, went underneath the Golden Gate Bridge and everything. So we saw a lot of a lot of neat things, and, uh, and then you took yeah. Then we got back on a train again <clears throat> and came back into. To Moline, which was a train station, and uh, it's it's kind of a, a scary thing, scary feeling. All of a sudden, you're brought back into civilization. And uh, when we, when I landed in, uh, when I came into Moline, and uh, of course Marilyn was there waiting for me, and uh, I had to sit on a, on a, picnic bench for. It was it was quite some time. I was just just shaken. I don't know. It's 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 a it's a strange uh, strange feeling. All of a sudden, uh, I guess almost like getting out of a some people getting out of prison or somewhere. I guess, but uh, you're all of a sudden you're put put down and uh, you just you just uh, took a while to get uh, to, 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 you don't really feel comfortable being back home. I had no understanding of what he went through. I didn't leave my home. I didn't leave my country. I wasn't in service. I didn't have to go to these different places. I had no idea of what somebody else never thought about it. See, I was in, a, I was in my safe world. He went out of that world. And I never thought about that. Maybe too naive at the time. I was quite young. Um, didn't really read much about the war. They didn't, well, they didn't publish it like World War II. So the different things that went on was what he told about. And it didn't affect me in the same way. We had a wedding planned and we got married just a few weeks after he got home. It probably wasn't a good time he didn't have a chance to make any adjustments to being back into civilian life, into, into the, the world again, into the civilian world. Um, and it was
was probably not good on, on a marriage because I didn't understand a lot what he went through. It takes a long time for a recuperation, but uh, probably not as long as it took a lot of guys that got were in prison camps and that. But. We lived it out. We worked it out, you know. We both took things as it came. You, you work your way back into uh, civilization and uh, uh, nobody either knows or very few, I should say very few people care that uh, what you did or where you went or anything like that. And uh, I guess you just go, about, go back to trying to live a normal life, you know. I mean, there weren't, it, it, it took quite a few years uh, for people to realize it, I guess. To, it took took me, I think, 40-some years before somebody said, you know, thanks, thank you for, for being over there, you know. So it, uh, um, it was uh, just kind of a forgotten war, you know, and, uh, but other than going through all this, uh, you, there were a lot of, it wasn't all bad and everything. I mean, there, you met a lot of good guys. And a lot of friends in that, and that you, of course, you you live with them every day, and you and you train with them every day, and so I mean, you it was a lot of good experiences, and uh, uh, I I don't think I'd ever regret it, and uh, it was it was I think uh, it'd be good for any any young fellow to go through something, you know, go through training and everything, but uh, there was a lot of good uh, good experiences. After I, after I got out, um, uh, there was a portrait photographer in Moline by the name of Kalbrick, and he had written me uh, while I was in the service, and he wanted me to come and uh, work for him and possibly go in partnership with him. And um, anyway, I I went to work for him, and uh, it was he uh, he was very meticulous. And um, somewhere or other, I think I, was, I wasn't with him too long. I suppose a couple of months. And I uh, coming coming out of the service, I I just wasn't ready to um, settle down. I guess I'm not sure what the word is. Uh, and so I, we we kind of uh, we it just didn't work out. And so then I I went to work for for John Deere. Yeah. Uh, I tried to get into the photo department, so in the meantime, I went to work in one of their factories, the plow planter, and I was a clerk draftsman. Uh, we drew up uh, uh, core boxes and match plates and uh, kind of like, and then I drew them up and then they, uh, and then also I was a, a clerk there. I took care of the time sheets and everything. So in the meantime, every so often I would call the photo department and see whether there's any openings, and I think maybe they, uh, got tired of me calling and so they finally uh, they said okay come on in so anyway I went went to work with uh, with Deere and Company in their uh, photo department I was in there in the dark room for oh I suppose a couple of years and uh, then they asked me if I wanted to uh, become a photographer with them <coughs> which meant uh, I'd have to travel so that was kind of a decision I had to make too, and so I, um, which means that you know I just wouldn't, I'd be gone every so often. So I did, uh, I did take that, and of course there was more money in it, and uh, the, if I would have stayed in the darkroom, there, there wouldn't have been the, the the money to be made there for to raise a family. And so anyway, uh, I did become a photographer with them, and. Um, yeah. Today you'd almost have to go to school, or college, or anything to to learn all this. And back then it was just more or less a, kind of like an apprenticeship in a way. Uh, you learned on the, you learned from one day to the next. And there was a few guys that did go to college, but uh, yeah, you just kind of learned it as you went. And uh, of course, uh, it was it was it's always been a, a real good company. And uh, I always enjoyed them. I mean, it was a proud company. 
So I, I enjoyed being with him for, for 30 years. And I know uh, it. Um, uh, there were some things, uh, the travel uh, sometimes wasn't always the best, you know, at the right time. But uh, all in all, I think it worked out pretty well, even with um, with all the kids. Uh, they, When I did come home, we, we did spend time together and our vacations. You never knew. You never knew where, uh, when, uh, when it was going to be your time, and um, being that I, you know, grew up in a Catholic family, and we were always we always went to church. That was very important. And I know when I was in uh, the service, that was always. Uh, that was, a, that was a priority to always go to church on Sunday, uh, no matter how tired you are or whatever. But uh, yeah, it uh, it gives you a lot of strength uh, to get through the rest of the week because there's uh, there's enough other problems. But um, we had uh, we had good uh, good chaplains, and uh, in fact, I even went on a on a retreat there when I was up in northern Japan. I uh, went to a retreat at a, at a monastery where uh, which was uh, which was kind of a, it was an interesting thing. There were uh, a lot of Japanese monks and and I tell you those guys uh, you can just see the 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 peace of, peace of mind in these uh, in their eyes. Anyway, part of history and uh, I guess it's uh, it's nice to have been able to be be part of it and uh, uh, nice today that. We we don't have that, that that tension and everything about about having to uh, you know uh, having war stare you in the face, and uh, one other thing I might mention too is that war it's it's not it's not enough just uh, that that the guy has to be uh, away, away from home for a long time and be in these situations, but you know the. Even the the other people back here, like like Marilyn, you know, uh, were you know she was very concerned for a long time. And <clears throat> another thing, another one would be um, the mothers. You know, my mother um, raised uh, four boys and three girls, and of course, uh, she already had two of them in the service. And so then I was drafted, so that was third one in service, and so. These people, they were always uh, very concerned, and thank God, uh, mom, mom and dad always said the rosary and uh, always prayed for us while we were gone. <clears throat> and but anyway, uh, and they would they would put a um, a flag in their window. If you had a member in the service, there was a there was a, a little flag. With a with a blue star, and this meant that you had a member in the service, and so anyway, if if your if the member got killed, well, then it would be a, a gold star. I think that's what it was. So when you go down the street, if you saw in the window, there's a there's a flag about about that size, and uh, they would hang it in the window. It just fit in there. But anyway, if you, whenever you saw these these flags with with a gold star, you knew that. That family lost someone in the service, and it was um, it was uh, really uh, really hurt to see that. But uh, he also saw all the blue stars that people were uh, proud of their kids that were that were in there. So that was that's one little thing. Since we've been up here in um, Winona, you've got a beautiful park here. Uh, there's monuments set aside for the World War One, World and Number Two, and the Korean War, Vietnam, and some of the others. But anyway, it's a it's a beautiful park. And beings we're up here at uh, they they've got they got bricks around uh, the Korean monument with everybody's name on it. And I thought it'd be kind of nice to 
to have my my name along uh, right in there with them. I feel like uh, this is where uh, this is where we live now, and and uh, anyway, uh, it's all you all you kids uh, uh, got together and got me this brick, and it's kind of a you know if you're ever in the area or uh, to be able to stop by and visit it and. You know you're you're part of it too. So, but it's a it's a nice remembrance. Very fortunate that we had a large family, uh, because um, there's it seems like there's always someone that comes home or someone that calls or uh, compared to people that don't have any any children, uh, they um, you can get pretty lonesome, I guess, when you get older and. Uh, there's, you know, there's no way there, but so I guess we're really blessed with them, with with all the kids and every one of them. Are, I tell you, there, think the world of. That's it. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, I, uh, uh, when I was a photographer over there, let's see. Oh, I guess right there. I guess those are the cameras that we used at the time. Now you just use little, little digital cameras or small cameras, but that's what we carried. And who, you can know who that handsome looking guy is. I don't know. So, and with all the, yep, even had hair. <laughs> Yeah. So, and here's a here's a picture of me in the dark room. I don't know if um, uh, spent a lot of time there. In fact, what happened is that we'd uh, a lot of times we would keep food in there, and uh, if there was inspections, well, we'd always make sure that uh, the officers wouldn't go in and uh, couldn't go in there and uh, inspect it because it was it was it's a dark room. You know, they couldn't come in. So we keep our food in there. So it was uh, it was one good place. And the magazine here that uh, that uh, Winona put out pieces of the past. I happened to uh, be part of that that magazine. They uh, they did a write up on me, and uh, that which is kind of neat. I didn't think, you know to be part of a. Let's see, it was in here somewhere. There it is. So, whatever you don't capture on this film here, you'll you'll find it in the book. So, John McRae's poem in Flanders Fields inspired Mona Michael to write these words in 1915 that began the tradition of wearing red poppies. We cherish too the poppy red that grows on fields where valor led. It seems to signal to the skies that blood of heroes never dies. Although Memorial Day has also become a day to place flowers on the graves of family members and friends, it still is a special day to remember those who gave their lives for our country and for our freedom. Today, the 3rd U.S. Infantry will patrol Arlington National Cemetery to maintain the more than 260,000 American flags they have placed by each grave site. In various cities around our nation, the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts will place flags, flowers, and candles on the graves of soldiers. We here assembled in Winona will honor our own fallen heroes. We acknowledge the many veterans here today who have lost friends and comrades during their service. These veterans, by their presence today, have heeded General Logan's words of 1868. If our eyes grow dull, other hands slack, and other hearts cold in the solemn trust, ours shall keep it well as long as the light and warmth of life remain in us. We resolve to never forget the sacrifices many have made for us. Each of us all owes the fallen a promise to build a free and prosperous nation until our own time comes to hear. Day is done, gone the sun from the 
hills, from the lake, from the, from the skies. All is well. Safely rest. God is nigh. Nice.